Today, over 2 million Americans are living in public housing. The discourse on public housing structures is generally that they're riddled with maintenance issues, crime and unsightly exteriors, or are the victims of budgetary constraints. The Great Depression marks the beginning of the US federal government's direct funding of public housing. So at this point, photojournalistic efforts had shown a light on the deplorable conditions of slums, and privately run charitable homes were already an established precedent. That's when the government decided to move beyond just regulating housing to actively providing dwellings for residents. It went from being a more locally operated affair to becoming a cabinet level program. And by the mid 90s, public housing had exploded from a small agency granting mortgage insurance to a massive program with 1.3 million individual housing units managed by approximately 3,400 housing authorities and a sizable budget. Biggest difference in nationwide public housing from its earliest inceptions in the 1990s 1930s to today is the way it was talked about and represented to the actual public. In an interview for City Lab, journalist Ben Austin notes that when it was first built, places like Chicago's Cabrini Green were seen as sites of hope and promise. So when public housing emerged on the scene as a nationwide initiative, it was accompanied by promises that it would be safe, affordable, government controlled, and regulated. But when did this narrative of hope and potential change? Early housing programs from the Great Depression were restrictive, highly regulated, enforced racial segregation, and prohibited single parents. And by the 1980s and 1990s, discussions about housing projects began to use language about race and crime as coded signs that the project themselves were failures. But if we look at it through this longer historical lens, it seems like the conditions people are critical of in public housing aren't inherent to buildings and systems themselves. They're problems that can and do emerge whenever housing is underfunded, not well regulated, and not well maintained, regardless of if the units themselves are publicly or privately owned. Public housing in Chicago occupied enormous sites in the city, many of which were very close to downtown, designed by renowned architects. And certainly we had exemplars of public housing developments in a very positive sense. There is nothing like walking into a building where you know people have lived their lives and had their joys and their tragedies. And you can feel it, you can feel it in the walls, you can feel it as you just cross the threshold. The power of the place and the importance of the preservation of those sites, it can't be underestimated. The J. Adams Homes is an example of these three-story walk-ups that worked quite well because uh, there were only a few families per entrance. And the end result was the families got to know each other very intimately. Public housing came in all sorts of forms, from uh, townhouses through high rises. I grew up in the Robert Taylor homes, which uh, to my knowledge was the largest of the public housing that existed in the, the United States. 16 floors with 10 apartments per floor. That's about 160 apartments in a building. Living in that dense of a setting, you develop a resiliency to be able to emerge from that, to uh, adapt to so many situations. Street lights, tall buildings, crowded hallways, broken elevators is where it began, not where it ended. We needed a transition leaving behind abandoned buildings, bricks and gravel on an empty lot. I'm a product of my environment, but I'm looking to inspire. See, I got a taste of the Black Power mixtape. Now everything in my ass looking a little vague. No time to play, I got a lot to gain. I'm on a mission. My name is Jack Metter. I'm the son of Inez and Harold Metter. They lived in these projects and they really liked it. They liked the people, they liked the facilities, they liked the closeness to the rest of the city. It was a good place to grow up. My family moved into public housing in 1949. It was an exciting and hopeful time for us. The building that we moved into was brand new. So we had a refrigerator for the first time. We had outdoors to play in. We didn't have to worry about the streets. In some ways, maybe the people who were in public housing were the lucky ones because they had newer buildings, newer facilities. 
I felt so lucky growing up at a time when, when the government believed that public was an important word, something that was honored. Our government wanted us to make it. About six or seven years ago, the residents of Abla came to talk to me and they asked me if I would help them with a public housing museum. The founder, Commissioner Devera Beverly, said that she wanted to leave a legacy behind of a national public housing museum that would actually tell our stories. It's a really important piece of history that we need to preserve for the millions of families and individuals that made their home in a public housing facility. I think we have an, an American story that we need to tell too and need to tell it through the people's lives, people who live there. That people can learn all that it was, all that it is today and all that it can be. We need a national public housing museum to dispel the notions that these buildings failed the people who were living in them. And someone had to s step up nationally to tell the story. Chicago could be the site to share with the world these really wonderful stories uh, and lessons about what the value of affordable housing um, brings to this country and to the world was one that we all should get behind. Chicago is no different than many other U.S. cities in that it's working hard to spur economic development by recruiting businesses and, attractive, and attracting creative professionals to the city. Our project focuses on Chicago's homegrown talent and invests in the entrepreneurial potential of public housing residents as a path towards strengthening the city's economic, social, and cultural fabric. The Entrepreneurship Hub addresses the lack of resources for small businesses owned and operated by public housing residents financial, design, technology, and access to social networks. Um, resources include financial coaching, uh, low-cost tax preparation, expert-led workshops on a range of topics. Um, this could be scaled up to include a full-fledged entrepreneurship competition juried by socially-oriented business folks in Chicago. Social entrepreneurs face a number of hurdles to move their businesses from the kitchen table to the storefront. While Chicago continues to pursue redevelopment of public housing projects, we have the incredible opportunity to amplify the entrepreneurial vision of public housing residents in the very communities they call home. Really saving uh, one of these buildings to house the museum is, is important. Having a museum and apartments laid out the way that they would have uh, been in any particular era is going to be particularly interesting to a lot of people. See, everybody knew everybody, somebody knew somebody. We're all like family. We stuck all together. Icy cup chips for cheese me please, to the lady on the fourth floor. That was the candy store. I remember the summertime field trips and back to school parties playing on the porch with my cousins. Going to the center, great childhood memories. We need to get that all back for our generation. We need communities back. We, we need our people back. Why not start here?